Hello class, we are now going to take a look at an SN2 reaction where we have an alkyl halide treated with our iodide and we see we get a substitution. But we're going to take a look at a table here and show what happens when you change the look of the alkyl halide. <clears throat> so this right here okay, is the reaction that we're going to compare everything to. So when we took this alkyl halide here and put it in for here and did the SN2, we clocked it, we found the rate at which this transformation occurred, and we set that as one. We're like, okay, whatever that rate is, we say it's one. And then we're gonna compare this guy, this guy, and this guy. And in relationship to this, does it go faster or slower? So what we see here is when we have the methyl bromide, it goes 145 times faster than when you use the, what type of alkyl halide is this? Hopefully you all say that is a primary alkyl halide. So the methyl halide goes 145 times faster than the primary. Now when we look at this guy right here, what type of alkyl halide is that? Hopefully you all say that is a secondary alkyl halide. And then right here we have a tertiary alkyl halide. Now when you're looking at these, what we're paying attention to when we are figuring out the degrees of an alkyl halide, we're just asking how many alkyl groups are attached to the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is the one that's directly attached to the alkyl or to the halogen. <clears throat> so we can see that in a SN2 reaction, that the fastest reaction is the methyl bromide. But the fastest be of the reactions besides the methyl bromide, just the primary to the tertiary, we see that the primary alkyl halide is the fastest. And with a tertiary alkyl halide, we get absolutely no reaction. Now that's technically not true. It's actually neg negligible. But for our purposes, we are just going to say, if you try to attempt to do an SN2 reaction on a tertiary alkyl halide, does not happen. Does not happen at all. Okay. So why is that the case? Well, let's just sum up what's going on here. Okay. We can say, what is the most reactive? It goes in that trend right there, right? That is the most reactive. Least reactive, okay? That is very, very important to remember and to know. Now let's delve into the reasons why. Why is this the observation that we see? So what are the principles here? <clears throat> well, if we take the primary alkyl halide and draw it like this, okay, and so we will have what? We'll have a hydrogen here, another hydrogen, and then our methyl. All right. So in an SN2 reaction, what's happening? Well, we know the nucleophile, which in this case is the iodine, has to attack backside attack. It's always backside attack. And we can see, based off hysterics of here, hydrogen atoms are small compared to a methyl group. And so this iodine can weasel its way in backside attack and kicking off the bromine. But if you compare that to uh, the tertiary, just don't want to run out of board space here. We would have a methyl there, a methyl there, and a methyl there. 
And if we attempt to get that iodide to try to weasel its way in to kick that off in an SN2 fashion, that cannot happen because there's just too much sterics here. The iodine, iodide cannot find its way to get in the backside. There's just too much going on here. We, when we look at the secondary alkyl halide, it can still happen, but look how much slower it is compared to a primary alkyl halide. So even secondary uh, alkyl halides, they can undergo SN2 uh, mechanism, it can undergo the SN2 mechanism, but not as well or as fast as the primary. And it's just a steric argument. That's really what it comes down to. Trying to get the iodide backside. These guys right here block that approach. This, the hydrogens don't block the approach, they're just too small. Another way we can look at these rates is by looking at the reaction coordinate with regards to the potential energy. So if we take a look at a primary alkyl halide, it's going to have a, a diagram that looks like this. Okay. And what we have here, that distance right there is what? The energy of activation. And that line, that green line there, is for what? The primary alkyl halide. And so that's going to go at its rate, and we've said that's going to be a rate one. But if we take a look at a secondary, what's the difference? Now I'm going to draw the secondary in this pink line here. What's the difference? The difference is the energy of activation. You see how much larger that is? That energy of activation is much higher in energy, hence the reaction is going to go slower. That ener energy of activation influences the reaction rate. Okay. Now another interesting thing that inter uh, influences our kinetics or the rate of the reaction is substituents on the beta carbon. So here we have a beta carbon. Okay. So those are beta right there. And so we're going to draw a, another table now to take a look at this very reaction right here. But now we're going to focus our attention on the beta carbon here. So let's say we look at something like this. Okay, and that, we'll compare it to that guy. And am I going to run out of board space? You can see that, and you can see that. So here's our alpha. But we're not concerned about our alpha right now. We are concerned about our beta. All right, there's our beta, beta, beta. Now the substituents on the beta carbon can also influence the rate of the reaction. We're going to take this, rea this one right here, which is the same as that one, and say its relative rate is one. And now we're comparing the rates of all these guys. And look at what's happening. Can you see a trend of what's happening here? It gets slower and slower and slower. One, two, three, four. Look at that. When we go to our fastest reaction right here, we only have a methyl group. All right. 
No, no. We, we, on the beta carbon, there's only hydrogens. And then on this beta carbon, there's a methyl group and two hydrogens. Two methyls, one hydrogen, and then three methyls. Do you see how even on the beta carbon, it influences the rate? So let's just try to wrap, make sense of all of this. What did I say over here? I said that ignoring this guy right here, okay, ignore that one for right there, just one, two, and three. Of the one, two, and three, which is the fastest? It's the primary alkyl halide. But look at these. These are all primary alkyl halides. And the beta carbon is now influencing how fast these primary alkyl halides react. And it comes back to sterics. You can see that this is a whole lot more bulky and sterically, it, it will sterically hinder the attack of the nucleophile on the alpha carbon. So typically we, in most organic textbooks, you will see the statement that SN2 reactions love to react with primary alkyl, alkyl halides. That is true. But we have to be a little cautious with that statement and say, hey, we not all primary alkyl halides can undergo an SN2 reaction if the beta carbon is very sterically hindered. Right. But we can say most alkyl halides, or most, sorry, most primary alkyl halides will undergo an SN2. It's this guy right here is the exception. Okay. And that is so slow that we basically say the, there's really no reaction. Okay. We could say that, but that's not entirely true because it does react. It's just really, really slow. But it's so slow, it's just not practical. All right? So we just went over how the degree of the alkyl halide can affect the rate of an SN2 reaction. Another thing that we need to look at that affects the rates of SN2 reactions is nucleophilicity. And nucleophilicity is simply asking the question, how fast does the nucleophile react with the alkyl halide? The nucleophile can also influence the rate at which a reaction or an SN2 reaction can occur. So we can say for an SN2 reaction, we want strong nucleophiles. And strong nucleophiles react fast. If you have a weak nucleophile, then they typically don't undergo a SN2 mechanism. They do other mechanisms. So for a SN2 reaction, we want a strong nucleophile. Now there's many factors that influences whether a nucleophile is strong or not. The first factor that influences a nucleophile's strength is charge. So if you compare, let's say, hydroxide versus water, both have lone pairs. So both technically could act as a nucleophile because there's some electrons there, there's more electrons there. So when you compare these two, we would say, hey, this one right here is the stronger nucleophile when comparing water. All right. So we could see if we just did a simple reaction, if we had, which do I want to do here? Let's do um, methyl 
um, iodide. And we treat that with hydroxide. You can see it's going to come like this to give us our product right here. D -d 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 plus iodide right there. And this reaction that I just drew is going to go a whole lot faster than if I try to do it with water. And that all has to do with the fact that you are looking at plus iodide. Okay. Now, when you look at those two reactions, uh, we see that we have this positively charged oxygen species. And so what we would do is we do another step we would do a proton transfer step in which we remove one of these hydrogens and generate our alcohol. But, but that's a little offshoot, okay? I digressed a little bit. But the point is, is this first step right here. We will see that this one will go fast and this one will go slow. And it boils down to the fact that this has a negative charge that one does not. Okay? Because all else is this all else is the same. This has a partial positive right here. And this one has the same partial positive because it's the same molecule. So you can imagine something that has more charge is going to be attracted uh, more strongly to the positive. That negative charge can be attracted more strongly to that partial positive than these electrons to that partial positive. Another thing that we need to address, another factor that influences the nucleophilicity is polarizability. Remember polarizability is when you compare, let's say, a, fluor a fluorine atom versus iodine. The electrons in iodine can and are further away from the nucleus. So they're not held as tightly. So there's a little bit more freedom of these electrons. And if they're polarizable, then they can go to one side or to the other side. Whereas in fluorine, they're held more uh, tightly to the nucleus and they don't have as much freedom of movement. Now, how many electrons do they have? I, that's not the point. Fluorine is going to have a, you know, and iodine is going to have a whole lot more. But the fact is, the size uh, influences polarizability. And when you compare these two ideas, charge versus polarizability, more often than not, polarizability is more important than charge. So if we take a look at some very strong nucleophiles. Let's make a list here of some strong ones. We would have, let's see, we have all the halogens. Iodide, chloride, bromide, okay? But we do not have fluoride. Fluoride is not going to be on this list of strong nucleophiles. And the reason why is because fluoride can behave as a strong nucleophile and a weak nucleophile. It all depends on the solvent that we are going to use. So we, later on in the discussion, we are going to look at how does the solvent choice that we make influence the rate of reactions. So for right now, we're just going to say fluoride is not on our list. Those are our strong nucleophiles. And then we could have sulfur containing species. Okay. We could have our hydroxide species. 
right? So there's our hydroxide, there's our alkoxide. Another strong nucleophile is the cyanide. And that's going to have a negative charge on our carbon. Okay, so that right there, this little list right here, are some common uh, strong nucleophiles. What are some common weak nucleophiles? We could have water is a weak nucleophile. So these are weak. Another very common one, weak nucleophiles are called alcohols. All right. So yes, they can behave as nucleophiles, but when we're comparing reaction rates, the SN2 reaction that's going to proceed the fastest is the one that has the stronger nucleophile. All right. So if we take a look at our strong nucleophiles, it then begs the question in this group, which one's stronger? Is the hydroxide versus the sulfur containing species? Which between these two, which one's the stronger nucleophile? We can't make that call yet because we haven't learned all the factors that affect how a reaction, all the factors that affect the reaction rate. And so we can't say right now which one's the stronger nucleophile, but here's some foreshadowing. It has to do with solvents. In one type of solvent, this guy will be the stronger nucleophile, and in a different solvent, this guy is going to be in a, uh, a stronger nucleophile. So we can't just look at them and say which one's the stronger because it's dependent on the solvent. Okay, so let's, all you have to understand is that they're strong nucleophiles if they have charge and they are polarizable. We're now going to shift our attention from looking at SN2 reactions or substitution reactions to elimination reactions. And much like substitution reactions, remember how with the substitution reaction, I had the concerted versus the, the stepwise mechanism. And the concerted reaction was SN2, and the stepwise was SN1. Well, we kind of have the same idea here when we're doing eliminations. So if we have, let's say, carbon, carbon, Uh, and I don't care what those groups are. And this is that. It's not a hydrogen, actually. That has to be a halogen. And when you take a strong base, okay, let's say hydroxide, and we will talk about later what I mean by strong base. Just for right now, strong base. Okay. If we take a strong base, mechanistically what's going to happen is we have to first identify that this is our alpha, because that is the carbon that is directly attached to the halogen. And then we find what carbon is attached to the alpha, and that is, would have to be the beta. You have to identify the beta. And so once you find alpha, you see a halogen. Then you find beta, and then you have to find a hydrogen on the beta carbon. And that's the carbon or the hydrogen that's going to be abstracted off. So the base is going to come and grab that proton. And then that carbon-hydrogen bond is going to break and it's going to donate its electrons between the alpha and the beta carbons. And then a third mechanistic arrow, the carbon-halogen bond breaks. And that's going to give us our product that looks like this. 
and that's going to be our alkene. All right. So this reaction is concerted. You can see that there's one reaction step. One, it goes from here to there in one step. I'm looking now at how many arrows there are. And this would be a concerted reaction because it happens all in one step. Now this reaction is concerted. It's also referred to as beta elimination right? because we're eliminating a hydrogen on the beta carbon. And then we could also call it a 1-2 elimination. We call it a 1-2 elimination is because if we numbered, trying to find a different color here, if we numbered the alpha beta as 1 and 2, we can see that we are eliminating a halogen on carbon 1, and we're eliminating a hydrogen on carbon 2. So it's a 1-2 elimination because we're eliminating atoms on carbons 1 and 2. So we have beta elimination, 1-2 elimination, the process is concerted, and then we can name it another thing, and that would be a E2. This process or this mechanism is called a E2 mechanism. Just like we've seen SN2 and SN1 mechanisms. So what does the E stand for? Elimination. That's pretty easy to remember, right? And then what does the 2 represent? Just like SN2, what did the number 2 in SN2 uh, tell us that it's bimolecular. So two means bimolecular because what's happening? We have one molecule, two molecules, all reacting in one step. Okay. Now, just like uh, SN2, E2, okay, the rate of E2 reactions follows the same thing. That's dependent upon the alkyl halide concentration and the concentration of the base. So when we doubled the concentration of the alkyl halide, the rate doubled. Or if we just doubled the concentration of the base, the rate doubled. So a E2 reaction is a second order reaction. All right. Now, let's contrast this with a different mechanism. So I'm going to erase all of this right here, and we will put back E2. So that's an E2 mechanism. Now, what if we had the same alkyl halide Right. That needs to be an X, something like that. What if the mechanism looked like this? The halogen or the leaving group leaves first. And then we're going to have Boom, boom, and that's going to be what? Positively charged, and the leaving group is now floating around. We will do another reaction now. But what, what is this step? Elementary step. What's that called? That would be our heterolysis. That's our heterolysis step. Okay. And now we introduce our base, a strong base here. That's negatively charged. And that base is going to 
react with the hydrogen on the beta carbon. So that's alpha, that's beta, and put the electrons there to give us the same product. And that would have generated hydroxide reacting with that would generate our water. All right. Now, let's clean that up there. So what is the name for this elementary step right here? Okay, and that has a name. And what, make sure I spell this right. This would be called a electrophile, electrophile elimination step. And you can see now this is what? This mechanism is stepwise. Okay. So each step, this step is the heterolysis, then you do the electrophile elimination step, gets us to the same product. But this overall stepwise mechanism is called a E1 mechanism. Why is it, what does the E stand for? An elimination product. And the one stands for this guy right here. You can see that there's one molecule. So the one stands for unimolecular. So at this step right here, we have a unimolecular uh, uh, mechanism and that's where the name comes from. But what we want to talk about uh, more is for the E2. I'm just introducing the E1, but now we're gonna focus our attention on E2 and learn the ins and outs of this reaction. And then we will come back to the SN1 and the E1 and learn those with, in greater detail. Okay, so let's clean off this board and learn more about E2. Do you recall when we looked at the reaction rates of SN2 reactions with a strong nucleophile? and we established that primary uh, alkyl halides react the fastest, secondary can undergo an SN2, but tertiary cannot due to sterics. Remember that? Well, what about when we take a look at the same alkyl halides, but now we want to react it with a strong base. So we want to do a elimination. That would be tertiary, and that would be secondary. Okay. What's interesting is there's no reaction for SN, for SN2, there's no reaction for tertiary alkyl halides. No reaction. But when we want to do an elimination, all of them work. Now the reason, why does a tertiary alkyl halide work for an E2, but does not work for SN2? Well, let's just look at a very simple uh, explanation as to why that's the case. Because if you look at, let's say, let's go, let's look at the bromine here. Okay, so what do we have here? If we want a nucleophile to come in backside attack, it can't due to sterics, right? All the sterics here. So if I if I want to represent all that sterics, I'm going to represent it just by these circles here. Okay, so there you see a lot of sterics there. The nucleophile can't get in because the pink circles represent sterics. 
Well, we're going to have those same sterics here when we want to do a elimination. All right, same sterics. But remember, a base does not want to come in backside attack. What do bases do? They want to abstract the proton that's on the beta carbon. So we establish that this is the alpha carbon. So that makes that guy there the beta. And what's so cool about the elimination is that the proton is basically on the outside of all that sterics. So the base, when it comes in to abstract that uh, alpha or that beta proton, it doesn't have to worry about the sterics because the hydrogen is above all that steric. So all it does is come in, grab that, bring that down, just like that. So moral of the story, E2 mechanisms can occur for primary, secondary, and tertiary alkyl halides when you're using a strong base. Okay? When dealing with E2 reactions, there's another thing that we need to be aware of, and that's the regioselectivity. And regioselectivity is when you have a situation when you can make two different products, because mechanistically you can, but you select for one of them over the other. So what I mean by that is if we want to do an E2 uh, mechanism here. What do we have to do? We find the alkyl halide, which is the leaving group, and it is attached to the alpha carbon. And so we need to find the beta carbons. There's a beta carbon, and there's a beta carbon. There lies in our challenge. We have a beta carbon with hydrogens and a beta carbon with hydrogens. So which one do we pick? We could pick this guy. Or we could pick that guy. Which one do we do? Well, for right now, just select both of them. So I'll do, let's do this one. Let's pick this guy. So if I grab that proton, the carbon-hydrogen bond is going to break, going to put the electrons between the alpha and the beta, and then that's going to what? Make the bromine leave. And so we just draw exactly what the pink arrows are showing us. I have a carbon here. Boom, boom. And I made a double bond there. There it is. I removed that proton. So there's a product. Now let's do the other one. Draw it a little differently here, then that goes there. Because what's happening here, there's our alpha, there's our beta. And what's our product going to look like? Well, if we go like just following the arrows, we have a double bond there and a methyl there. Okay. So when we take these molecules, these are the same, right? And we put them into a beaker and we add some ethoxide, say react, we will get a mixture of these two products. But regioselectivity says one of these is going to be favored over the other. And in these conditions, this is 71% and this is only 29%. So we can see when we do a reaction in one reaction vessel, we're going to get a mixture but we select for only, we select for one over the other. Now it's not 100% this and 0% that. There's still going to be a little bit of a mixture here, but we select for this guy. And that's 71%. Now, generally speaking, what's the diff, well, what's the difference between these two, okay? When we look at this, this alkene, this is a tri-substituted alkene. Remember when you figure out the substitution pattern, 
you look at the two carbons here, those two, the what the between the double bond there, and ask how many alkyl groups are attached. There's one, two, three. So that's tri-substituted. And then we do the same thing for this guy and see that there's um, one, two. So that would be di-substituted. When trying to figure out which product is going to be the uh, most uh, prominent species, we have what's called the Zaitsev's rule. Let's spell that right here. Or the Zaitsev product. That's probably the better way of putting it. When you are using a non bulky base, okay, so we can have a bulky base and a non bulky base. Let's draw what that looks like. So, a non bulky base, our ethoxide here, looks like that. Okay. But if you had a bulky base, let's say tert butoxide, it would look something like this. And you're just comparing the sterics here. You see how this is linear, the, eth the ethyl group versus the tert butyl group right here. So that's very, very bulky. Okay. So that would be called, this one right here would be a bulky base. And we would say that's not a, no, a bulky base. Okay. So typically, when you are using a non bulky base, and you could have two different products right here, you're going to favor the Zaitsev product. And the Zaitsev's product is the one that is more substituted. So you can see between these two, this one in blue would be the Zaitsev product because it's more substituted. This product right here would be called the Hoffman product. And I always misspell that guy's name. I don't know how many F's and M's are in this guy, guy's names here. Let's see here. Let's double check that. This would be called the Hoffman product because it is uh, not as substituted as this one. So oftentimes, when we do this reaction with a non-bulky base, we would say this is the Zaitsev product, this is the Hoffman product, and the Zaitsev product is going to be favored. We could also refer to this guy as the anti-Zaitsev product. You'll see and hear that. That's the anti zaitsev product, or is referred as the Hoffman product. Okay? But then things change. The percentages here change depending on the base that you use. So if I do a bulky base, okay, so the mechanism is still the same. But if we do, the mechanism is still the same. It's just now we're using a bulky base, which, because it's bulkier, it's going to um, want to uh, find the hydrogen that's the least sterically hindered. Okay. So when it has options, this thing is so bulky, bulky, it's like, which of these hydrogens can I access more easily? All right. So when you use a bulky base, what's going to happen here is that, yes, this is still going to be tri-substituted. Right. But watch what happens to the um, uh, percentages here. Right. They change. We go to 28% and then 72%. Like so.
Now, when I take a look at this molecule right here, and I've identified my beta hydrogens, this one and this one, how can I look at those two hydrogens and make an educated decision on which one is more sterically hindered? And the way I do it is I look at the hydrogen of interest, I see what carbons it's attached to, and then I count how many carbons are directly attached to that carbon. One, two. <laughs> so that's kind of like secondary. And then if I look at this one, the hydrogen is attached to that carbon, and then that's attached to what? One carbon. So that's kind of like primary. If I, if I replace these with, um, let's say, halogens, for example, we would call that a primary alkyl halide, and that one would be a, a secondary, right? I'm kind of doing that same analysis, analysis when I'm looking at the hydrogens. I see that's secondary, that's primary. So the, the more bulky or the more sterically hindered hydrogen would be this one. And that's why that's going to, and that's why the Zaitsev product here is going to be the not selected for. It's going to be the Hoffman because the steric, sterically hindered base here can access the less sterically hindered hydrogen better. Okay. Let's see here. So that's the regioselectivity that you need to be aware of. And it's very, very important that you can, when you're looking at an E2 reaction, that you can identify if the base is bulky or if it's not bulky. So oftentimes you will see um, it represented like this, tert butoxide, like that. That's tert butoxide, which simply means that with the potassium. That K right there is potassium. It's just a spectator ion. Okay, so that's terputoxide. We have diisopropylamine. Diisopropyl. Right? Diisopropylamine. Uh, let's see there. That, that's another bulky base, those isopropyl groups right there, right? There's a bulky base. We also have um, triethylamine that we consider a bulky base. The triethylamine would look like this. Something like that. So those are some very common bulky bases that you need to be aware of. Another thing that we need to be aware of is that when we're looking at E2 reactions, we have stereoselectivity. So first we looked at regioselectivity, and now we're going to look at stereoselectivity. So if we take a molecule that looks like this, and we want to treat it with a strong base, and we're going to invoke the E2 mechanism, the process is the same. Identify alpha, there's our beta, and there's a beta. But what's interesting is that this molecule is symmetrical. So if you chose to eliminate this hydrogen versus this hydrogen, it would not matter. It would give you the same product. If you don't believe me, try it out. Rip off this proton, draw your product, and then do it all over again and rip off this proton, draw the product, and then compare the two products. And you'll see that they're the exact same thing. But regioselectivity okay, is going to do something here. Mechanistically, okay, we have our lone pairs here. They're going to come in and abstract that proton, bring that down, and kick that off, right? Just like a... Uh, E2 mechanism, that's what it's supposed to do. 
And so that's going to give us our product. So draw it exactly the way that you see it here. Follow the pink arrows. We have this, this, and then this and this, right? And so our double bond is going to go there. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Just like that, right? But guess what? This molecule right here, remember looking at different conformers? That molecule could look like this. All right. Maybe let's draw this. Yeah, let's draw it like that. That's better. All right. Well, we have different conformers. There's free rotation around these bonds, right? What if at a specific moment in time, you had this conformer, and then your base comes in, and it comes in and does the same E2 mechanism, but now we are just in a different conformation. Draw it exactly what the arrows are showing us. We have a zigzag, up, boom, double bond like that. See that? So what do we have here? We have our trans alkene, and then we have our cis alkene. So if you can have two different uh, stereoisomers here, and one is selected over the other, then we have a stereoselective E2 reaction. So when we take a look at that, which one is going to be the major product? And in this case, this one's going to be the major. The trans is the major, and the cis is the minor. And we are selecting for the trans. So that introduces the concept of stereoselective reactions here. Now, as to why is the trans the major and the cis the minor, well, we're going to have to wait for the next video to discuss that. But there is a reason, and a very good reason at that. And you need to understand the principles that governs the stereoselectivity of these alkenes. Very, very important. Okay. So we will see you uh, next time.